Good, on, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to our uh, Dandre Partner Legal Counselors webinar. Uh, my name is Matteo Zhu, and I'm senior partner of Dandre Partners Legal Council. And uh, today I have the pleasure to moderate this insightful webinar about investing in Russia from a legal and commercial perspective. Uh, in the past weeks, we have already had the chance to discuss about uh, different uh, uh, countries, uh, about their current economic, economic uh, status, and about the FDI situation there. So today, we would focus on uh, Russia Federation uh, in order to provide to you a different uh, angle of view uh, to make a comparison between countries. Before moving on, I would like to remind you all that this chat, this chat is available to ask questions and our speakers will answer to your questions during, at the end during the Q&A session. Today, we are honored to have three speakers joining, out, joining us in our panel. First, we will have Mr. Vyacheslav Deniskin, representative of the Russian Federation Chamber of Commerce and industry in Shanghai, and Mr. Artyom Kormitistin, Chief Executive Officer and Head of Capital Markets of Asia Pacific of Gazprom Bank Hong Kong. And the last but not least, we have Ms. Alexandra Popova, Legal Advisor of the Russian Desk of Thunder Partners Legal Council. To start our today's webinar, we will have the honor to uh, invite Mr. Vyacheslav Deniskin to introduce us an overview of the economic and the investment potential for the Russian Federation. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How can you hear me? Is this okay? Yes. Of course, it's okay. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this event. And uh, I would like to say in briefly uh, our situation in uh, uh, in terms of, of investments first of all i would like to show you some uh, presentation introduce uh, our chamber of commerce and industry just very briefly and uh, demonstrate you some figures maybe for for more understanding situation in uh, investments in uh, and in russia economy uh, okay i uh, I would like to start with uh, my presentation. Uh -huh. Okay, can you see can you see my presentation? Yeah, okay. Yes, perfectly. Just uh, several uh, several uh, uh, several words about our country who, who if somebody does not know about uh, this uh, anything uh, you know about our uh, one successful, two successful events in Russia in Sochi Olympic Games and uh, FIFA World Cup uh, in uh, 2018 and uh, 2014. Uh, just for present our country just a little bit. Okay, uh, the next one. Uh, CCI, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry of the Russian Federation. This is a non profit organization. Uh, which is designed to promote uh, our business uh, interests uh, in other countries, in other different parts of, of the world. Uh, you can see the tax, tasks, our tasks, protecting business, fostering exports, developing relations, a system in investment, by the way, uh, promotion in this uh, field, uh, promoting the principle of civilized business and social responsibility. Uh, so this, uh, this is our tasks. Okay, uh, uh, our chamber, uh, more than 50,000 uh, enterprises, large, medium, and small businesses, non profit organizations, and individual entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a very, uh, very interesting structure, our chamber of commerce and industry, because uh, every our region has uh, own a chamber of commerce and industry. And we have uh, 180 regional chambers uh, commerce and industry uh, this is very uh, suitable for development uh, develop, uh, developing uh, inter-regional uh, uh, links inter-regional relations between uh, 
Russian regions and, of course, uh, on the international uh, level. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, about 70 business councils all over the world and more than uh, 800 committees, commissions, councils, and so on. Uh, in our structure, in, uh, within the frameworks of our structure, we have the World Trade Center. This is uh, part of uh, a worldwide network of international, international trade centers. Expo Center, this is a very big Expo Center in Russia. So it's Expertiza, Inspection, Expertise, Expertiza, and so on. So it's Patent, and of course, Center of Arbitration and Mediation. Uh, I, I am not going to, uh, to tell a lot about our uh, companies and if you uh, if you want to have this information i can share uh, share it with you uh, this is our expo center in the center of the city moscow moscow city uh, our world trade center in moscow so uh, uh, okay uh, i would like to present you some figures about our economy Macroeconomic indicators. Uh, you can see uh, some of our success uh, in uh, in the last year, and uh, uh, 1.3 uh, percent. This is uh, GDP growth, not so high, but nevertheless. Okay. Uh, the next one. Uh, this is uh, macro trends and medium term forecasts. Uh, this uh, focus, this focus is based on uh, uh, international organizations uh, and uh, the statistics of our some of our ministries, central banks and uh, central bank and others. Uh, you can see, uh, I, I can I can show this. Uh, just you can concentrate just only on one period, I think, and 19, uh, 2019 uh, year, uh, and you can see that. Uh, uh, this year, current year, uh, we can uh, we cannot take these figures like uh, the, the true figures because you know the situation with the coronavirus. <laughs> that is why uh, this is not this this is our uh, how to put it uh, our the best the best scenario for developing our economy. Uh, so, but uh, our perspective is rather well, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, discuss it. We, we, we can tell that this is a very good perspective for our economy in the further period in the future. Okay, uh, uh, let's uh, let me start our conversation about investments, uh, and uh, I would like to present you one the next one slide. Uh, this is uh, World Bank Group uh, rating rating in doing business, very well known in uh, all over the world, and. Uh, According to this uh, report, World Bank report, uh, our growth, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation growth in this uh, rating, uh, has been going on for on um, for nine years. Uh, nine years, you can see. Uh, and uh, Russia is in the club of countries with a good business climate of this uh, rating. Nine years of countries with a good in the rating becoming uh, more ambitious. Uh, for the fifth years, uh, for the fifth years in a row, Russia has the strongest position among in BRICS countries. Uh, Russians, Russia's neighbors were Austria and Japan, and uh, we managed to overtake Spain, France, Poland, Portugal, uh, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Belgium. Uh, the World Bank has recorded improvements in Russia in the areas of construction and. And bankruptcy law. This is very, very sensitive, sensitive sphere. Uh, with that. Uh, and uh, one of the best quality results uh, this year were the directions obtaining a construction permit connecting to networks uh, and the tax administration and bankruptcy law. Uh, this is a strong points. The, the best, best of them, the greatest. Uh, so uh, about our investments. Uh, this is uh, you can you can see the slide about uh, investments and fixed uh, fixed assets in Russia. Uh, uh, Twenty nineteen was the most successful uh, in terms of invest, uh, investment activity since the introduction of sanctions against Russia. The main driver of growth was the stabilization of the situation both uh, the 
uh, in the political and economic sphere. It is clear that uh, foreign investors needed to see several years of uh, normal functioning of the economy after the shock of 2014. Uh, the inflow of foreign investment uh, to the country has increased sharply uh, last year. Investments in domestic assets last year increased by almost uh, 50% and exceeded 20 billion USD dollars. Uh, in uh, 2019, the growth of investment in fixed assets, you can see on the slide, uh, this sum of money is about uh, uh, 19. 0.319 trillion rubles. Uh, in addition to foreign investment, uh, we can uh, mark uh, some other trends in our market. We can mark that uh, there, there are a lot of merchant and acquisition deals, M&A deals. Um, it, uh, the volume of these deals uh, is uh, about uh, 63 billion USD dollars, which is uh, 21.5 percent more than uh, 2018 uh, year. Uh, uh, what can we say about the, um, the countries who uh, invested in our country last year? Uh, investors from Asia Pacific region and uh, uh, the United States, uh, United States have shown the most interest in Russia last year. They invested more than uh, 8 billion USD dollars and almost 3 billion USD dollars, uh, respectively, last year. Uh, according to economists, uh, this year, of course, you know, uh, we need to take an account to take account uh, the situation with the coronavirus. But uh, in uh, in this year, the GDP growth rate in the Russian economy uh, may fall almost to zero. But uh, I think. All over the world, we, we can see uh, this picture uh, with the economy. Uh, we, we, we have very weak economy uh, in uh, every country all over the world. And of course, uh, after the coronavirus period, we, we will see some more trends for restore economy uh, in, in countries. Uh, but uh, economists say, say that uh, the focus uh, in investments this year and uh, next next year of course will be concentrated on oil and gas sector of course uh, this is our strong point of our economy and uh, technology and innovations uh, one more point I can add uh, this is real estate uh, the different different real estates this is commercial real estate is uh, uh, industrial real estate and so on uh, so uh, the volume of these transactions will grow uh, uh, in consumer sector as well, because after coronavirus, we uh, estimate that uh, our consumer market will grow uh, very sharply. Uh, so uh, the next slide I, I would like to present this is uh, investment attractiveness of uh, Russian regions, because every our uh, region has their own story, history has their own uh, features, specific and so on. You can see this is very fresh information from our uh, very well-known uh, agency, right group. Uh, you can see if you need, I can share with you this information. Of course, Moscow region uh, for, for this year. Uh, this is ranking, um, is designed for, uh, for, uh, for every year. And for this year, you can see the situation. Uh, Moscow region, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Krasnodar region, and so on. Um, well, this is, uh, uh, these are key factors of Russian economic attractiveness. Dynamic economic growth. Uh, it's not so dynamic, but for our economy, it's rather good. Uh, so the next one, one of the largest consumer markets. Uh, human capital, natural resources, geographic position, and uh, of course, technologies, technologies, uh, taxation system, uh, governmental support, and stable social and political system. So, this is very short information in brief, uh, and uh, I have a great pleasure to share with you my vision, my uh, my information about Russian market, Russian investments. So, thank you. If you have some questions, please, I'm ready to.
Okay. I'll see you. Thank you, Mr. Neskin, for this interesting sharing uh, from, from a macroeconomic point of view. Okay, like this, uh, we can um, generally understand about how uh, uh, Russia is made off and uh, currently situation. And of course, this year is difficult for uh, for every country from a foreign direct investment perspective. So, uh, of course, uh, all the governments are also trying to do their best to attract uh, more foreign direct investment to boom uh, the econ economy. Okay, uh, next we will try, after knowing about how uh, Russia is about from a macroeconomic point of view, we will also discuss how in practical we could uh, set up our investment in Russia. So we will uh, welcome Ms. Alexandra Popova uh, to introduce to us the legal perspective of foreign direct investments in Russia. Let's welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, so today I would like to talk about the economic FDI in Russia, but from the legal perspective. But first of all, let me introduce gender and partners. So our law firm is an international law firm that was created back in 2013 uh, by Studio de Andrea and Hyper Law Firm here in China. But straightly after this, uh, the law firm take the course for international development and expand it to such market as it uh, as uh, France, uh, India, uh, Vietnam, and uh, uh, Russia. So. We are able to provide uh, to our clients uh, such services as uh, uh, real commercial contracts, uh, corporate M&A, legal uh, translation, uh, drafting of uh, the contracts, uh, as an uh, assistant in foreign direct investment, establishment of your entities in different countries, as well as represent the representative services during the disputes. And these just uh, our offices that present in several countries. And here you can see on top Shanghai office from where I'm speaking with you. So talking about the FDI in Russia from legal perspective, today I will cover the legal framework, overall framework that uh, you would be need to face uh, entering the Russian market, then certain restriction limitations that prescribe our regulations for a foreign investor. Uh, the forms of uh, the legal entities that uh, you may use to establish a le uh, legal presence, as well as a basic overview of incorporation steps for a limited liability company. So, as a legal, uh, as a foreign investor, you would need to, uh, to understand that your legal frame framework that will cover your uh, activities in Russia quite vague. And the uh, uh, main law that you need to consider is the foreign investment law. I would like to point out that this law provides several guarantees uh, for the foreign investor, and one of the main of them is the equal treatment, meaning that you would get the same access as the residents for the uh, source of production that's provided by the law, as well as uh, uh, the opportunities for you. But uh, beside, uh, not even if uh, legislation provides equal treatment, you will need to face a certain restrictions that uh, you may be covered. And this restriction basically uh, put in the foreign investment under the federal law on the foreign investment in companies on strategic importance for national defense and state security, as well as uh, other laws that I would like to introduce you uh, here. So. Uh, the main, uh, the main uh, limitations we are providing by the federal law for investment in uh, the companies of strategic importance and national defense and state security, meaning that a uh, legislator put uh, a certain industries as the sensitive for the state security and would like to limit the presence of foreign investors with them within them, especially for the foreign public investor, meaning, for example, state-owned enterprise, as well as investors that would like to, uh, that, that don't want to disclose information 
for the beneficiaries of the companies. These investors would be prohibited to enter these sectors above the specific threshold. And other investors, private, invest, uh, private investors, they would need to go through the specific procedure of the prior approval in case if they will, will overcome the specific threshold and may be deemed as risky for the sector from the perspective of regulator. So uh, the main governing bodies that uh, uh, hold this uh, procedure are the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service and the Government Commission. Uh, on practice, for example, if you would like to be to invest in the uh, activities of uh, research of subsoil, uh, you would need to file all the documents uh, disclosing the information, disclosing the investment project to the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. That will give a first assessment. And for example, if uh, uh, it will realize that you acquire more than 50% of voting shares, uh, is the first criteria that you may see in an orange area, then it will pass, then it will say, okay, there could be the risk that you may gain a control upon the strategic, uh, the entity that involves the strategic industry. And then it will pass the documents to the government commission, the governing body that will actually take a decision on whether to approve or prohibit your legal uh, project. Uh, overall, this procedure may take from three to six months according to the regulation and somehow maybe uh, and sometimes maybe even longer. So we would suggest to consider this term uh, if you would like to plan to invest in these specific sectors. At the same time, the, uh, the other laws can prescribe uh, other, other limitations. For example, uh, as you know and as was already pointed out, the land is one of the main resources of the Russian Federation. So actually, as, even as a foreign investor, you allow to acquire the land, but uh, there, there is certain limitations. For example, as the foreign investor, you would be limited in terms of acquiring farmland, as well as acquiring land that adjusted to the uh, border of the country. Uh, along with this, uh, there is certain uh, sectors that are not directly regulated by the foreign investment law and they also may prescribe the certain limitations for the cap that you may be presenting such as for example mass media insurance that are actually one of the main uh, beneficiary of the foreign direct investment in Russia. And if you realize that okay you can go with your investment so what can be the, the uh, forms of your investment in Russia? Uh, our regulation provides quite a branch uh, choice for you of the uh, legal forms that you may choose from. The first of all is the representative office and a branch of foreign legal entity. These forms mainly used by the foreign uh, investors that would like to explore the markets to sell the, the products uh, in Russian market. So for them, this um, forms may be really bene uh, beneficial due to the fact that uh, they are quite simple in, in, uh, in procedure of establishment, so you would need to take just one month. Uh, at the same time, you would have the benefits for enrolling your foreign colleagues uh, due to the fact that there is this uh, benefits in terms of visa and work permits. Uh, at the same time, um, they, but at the same time, I need to point out that they are not proper legal entities. And therefore, you would not get a, a benefits of tax regulation that may be provided by the Russian law. And you, they would, for the representative office, you would not be able to, um, to, to execute a commercial activity independently in Russia. But at the same time, if you would like to uh, make your presence in Russia more dependent, you would go with the branch of foreign legal entity due to the fact that this, uh, in, in this way, the branch would be able to execute some commercial activity, but uh, this commercial activity would be limited by the business scope of the mother company. Therefore, if you would like, uh, for example, if you would like to enter a different sector compared to the one that uh, you execute your mother, uh, present your mother company, you may need to go with the other legal forms which may be limited level to company, non-public Johnstone company, and public Johnstone company. The most of uh, the 
investors usually go with limited liability and non-public joint stone company due to the fact that they are really more easy in way um, of uh, establishment. And uh, uh, the public joint stone company usually used only uh, by those investors that would like to attract to attract uh, public funds uh, to the company. So let's take a closer look on limited liability company and non-public joint stock company then. Uh, the limited liability company is the most preferential uh, for foreign direct investment, uh, and, but it, it provides you a cap of the shareholders that you may have. So the maximum shareholder, uh, number of shareholders will be 15. Uh, while the non-public uh, joint company can have an unlimited number of the shareholders. At the same time, I need to point out uh, many foreign investors would like to go through the offshore uh, to invest in the company. So I would like to point out that uh, in Russia there is exist 111 rule, or also named as Matrosh rule, uh, that uh, the share, shareholder of one uh, shareholder company cannot be uh, uh, cannot have just one shareholder. Meaning that, for example, you establish a company in, in uh, uh, Hong Kong that will have just one shareholder and would like to invest in Russia. You would not be able to do this if your share if your Hong Kong company has just one shareholder. After this, uh, I would need to point out that uh, the statutory minimum amount uh, that prescribed by the Russian regula regulation is quite low, and it's equal for limited level to company and non-public joint stock company, so it's uh, overall just uh, 125 US dollars. For public joint stock company, it uh, was to be said that it's a bit higher, it's uh, $1,250. And for those who are uh, following us from China, I would need to point out that in Russia, we have a specific term to, uh, in which these uh, uh, funds shall be injected to the company. So for limited level to company, you have a four, uh, the term of four months for the uh, statutory uh, capital to be injected. And uh, for the non-public and uh, public gesto company, you have uh, the time limit of three months within which at uh, 50% of your total capital uh, to be injected. At the same time, uh, we have the prescriptions for the uh, charter capital that uh, it shall be due uh, to the amount that's stated within the regulatory. Therefore, if you, on a certain point of view, you would like to uh, minimize your amount, you would need to adjust uh, the information in the register. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the time that we need to spend uh, to set up uh, companies, the limited liability company is quite fast to be set up, the same uh, term as for the rep office or branch, as you can see. While for the non public and public gestion company, you would need to secure from three to four months uh, to open, uh, open a company, and this is not a limited term. So, in, in certain cases, it depends on the area where you would like to be involved, this, this uh, period even can be longer. Also, I would like to point out several <laughs> points uh, for the governing bodies, for the management. Uh, overall, uh, the information that presented on the slide can be said that a limited level to company more flexible in terms of the governing. You can stop uh, the governing bodies in a way that you are used to within your country due to the fact the regulation allowed it, while a non-public gestion company and a public gestion company uh, pro, uh, do not provide you such flexibility and you need to be due a lot of the regulation in terms of uh, uh, the governance <coughs> of your subsidiary. As, as well as uh, for limited liability company, it has, uh, do not have, has a mandatory annual audit uh, to be ex uh, executed while the non-public gestion company and of course public gestion company uh, actually prescribe these requirements. So, and we go to the last point of how, uh, what you may need to, to do to incorporate your limited level to company. Uh, there is uh, six basic steps to make your subsidiary operatable. And first of all, you would need to prepare uh, all charter documents, meaning the agreement for establishment, uh, articles of association, documents for uh, the mother company, which actually need to be uh, legalized if we're talking, for example, about the China, or to be apostolized if we're talking about the Italy. Uh, after all, you need to find a premises that uh, can be used for a legal address. 
and uh, obtain a letter of intent and a title deed. And at the same time, on the same point, uh, you may need to find a person that may be uh, Enrolled into a company as the managing director due to the fact that uh, uh, this is one uh, important point. The basically in Russia, you can go uh, in most of the areas, you can go without a local partner to establish your presence. But uh, due to some uh, visa and work permit regulations, you would have to find a manager that would uh, execute the power of the, the managing director at least on the beginning or it may be a foreign person that has uh, the uh, visa and can proper visa and uh, can stay within the country so uh, we stay uh, we stay on the point that you find your premises that uh, you need to submit all the documents to the state register uh, which after will issue a certificate of registration after this you the your managing director will go to engrave a company shop and open a bank account. And after this, you would need to register with all the specific authorities, uh, such as uh, pension fund, social insurance fund, and other authorities required, especially for those that would like to enroll uh, foreign employees, you would also need to get a specific registration uh, to proceed with uh, this. So this was uh, all for me. I hope this information was uh, ever uh, good for you. So let me. Thank you, Alexandra, for this detailed presentation of uh, uh, FDI in Russia practical guide. Let's call it. If you have any questions on the practical side about how to set up company uh, in, in Russia. Uh, please prepare your questions and after we can discuss it with Alexandra during the Q&A session or you can uh, after also send us email to us about uh, with your questions. Okay, now we have uh, Mr. Artyom Komilsin, uh, the CEO of Gazprom, Gazprom Bank Hong Kong to present us the path to recovery of Russian economy following the current global crisis due to COVID-19. Welcome Artyom. Hello, everyone. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Andre and partners, uh, to uh, to give me an opportunity to 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 present uh, Gazprom Bank and uh, present. Uh, uh, Russian economy and uh, our view on the, on the, on this year how it will uh, will perform. Uh, I will start with a uh, uh, few words about uh, Gazprom Bank, bank uh, who we are and uh, what we are doing here in Asia. Um, so you've probably uh, heard about uh, our ultimate parent is uh, Gazprom Company, which is the uh, largest uh, gas producer uh, in the world and. Uh, uh, Gazprom Bank is uh, one of the uh, uh, subsidiaries and uh, affiliates uh, within within the group of uh, Gazprom. Uh, uh, Gazprom Bank is uh, third largest bank uh, in Russia. We are ultimately uh, owned by by the state, so we are sort of uh, an SOE. And uh, um, uh, Gazprom Bank is uh, quite uh, diversified in 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 terms of uh, its portfolio. We we're not only uh, focused on oil and gas uh, as as it may seem, but uh, we actually uh, deal with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, clients and, and customers. Uh, we are primarily focused on uh, providing services for our corporate clients, and uh, uh, that's why we are quite strong in uh, investment banking. So uh, we are uh, number one in terms of uh, M&A activities in Russia, and uh, as well as uh, number one uh, in terms of uh, capital markets activities. We are uh, number one underwriter of uh, Russian bonds, uh, both domestically and uh, internationally for, for Russian clients. And we are quite active uh, internationally. Uh, uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, we have a subsidiary, uh, GPB uh, Hong Kong Limited. Uh, it, this is a financial services company. We were not a bank here. We don't have a banking license, but we do have uh, 
Securities and Futures Commission's license here, so we are a brokerage. And we deal primarily with the uh, institutional investors. We distribute Russian securities uh, here in, uh, in Asia, in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, we also help uh, Russian, uh, Russian investors to invest uh, in, uh, in Asian securities. Um, today I will uh, uh, share a view on the uh, Russian economy and how uh, uh, the possible recovery will look like. Uh, we will, uh, of course, uh, worried about uh, uncertainties uh, which this year will bring. Not a lot of uh, so-called black swans, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we're, we're, we have to uh, have our view how economy will, will be developing in, uh, in the near future. Well, uh, Vyacheslav uh, already uh, mentioned on uh, Russian macro uh, in the past few years, and I would like to, uh, to share our view on the macroeconomy of uh, Russia in, uh, in, uh, in this year. So, I um, have to start with, uh, uh, with a little bit of a background, uh, uh, what uh, happens with the Russian economy, what, what factors are actually influencing uh, Russian economy the most. Uh, uh, actually, Russian economy was uh, hit not only by uh, coronavirus, but uh, also by um, uh, very uh, volatile and uh, low oil, oil prices. So um, <clears throat> um, we, um, we actually um, see this year that the GDP growth uh, may contract by nearly 4% by the end of this year. Uh, we, we expect uh, this uh, for a few reasons. The, one, uh, the first one is that um, uh, we see that uh, uh, household uh, income uh, decreased significantly uh, that, uh, uh, and uh, household uh, demand and spendings uh, are account for 50% of uh, Russian GDP. So uh, with a significant blow into the household income and uh, their ability to, to buy products, uh, that will bring uh, the GDP growth uh, significantly lower. Uh, we, we understand that um, uh, government is actually making all uh, necessary uh, measures uh, available to, to support the, the household, the, to support uh, uh, Russian uh, social uh, level of, of living, and uh, uh, but that comes uh, from uh, from a few sources, and one is the uh, so-called uh, uh, national the budget for for national national projects. So um, another uh, factor for lower GDP growth will be a lower investment activity. Uh, why we think uh, it will happen because. Uh, from a state point of view, a state will have to uh, secure the uh, social stability and uh, household incomes uh, and uh, help those who, who, who are unemployed or uh, who got uh, significantly uh, reduction of payment of, of salaries, of base, uh, base income. So this money will come from two sources. First, it will be uh, delayed national uh, implementation of national projects. And just to explain, national projects are uh, uh, quite uh, capex heavy uh, uh, infrastructural projects which were planned uh, for a while now. And uh, actually the, the year it should start to implement uh, uh, should be uh, 2020, but uh, given the whole situation, we, we believe uh, some of those projects will be postponed and the money will and the funds will be actually rewired to to support the the, the household uh, incomes um, when we look at the private sector we also uh, uh, feel that the uh, private sector will uh, postpone some of the some of the activities uh, private sector is very uh, sensitive uh, towards the uh, consumption uh, once uh, Private companies see that the consumption is uh, falling. They uh, uh, significantly reducing their uh, investment plans. So all in all, um, uh, that's what will uh, bring the uh, slow down the economy. What will support the economy? And you can see it's uh, on a 
right hand side uh, chart. What will support the economy? It's uh, it's exports. Now we expect that exports will actually will be supporting the economy during the, the slowdown. Uh, historically, uh, historical data shows us that uh, during the previous uh, previous crises, uh, the um, uh, the export by its physical volume actually stayed the same uh, or even increased. So uh, we believe that that will uh, actually support the economic growth. Um, when we're talking about uh, um, almost 4% uh, uh, decrease of uh, economic growth in uh, 2020, we we actually are looking at the um, uh, at certain uh, at certain uh, factors, and one of them uh, is uh, well the, the the major one is the lockdown effect. So um, I believe uh, we have uh, quite a few European uh, uh, customers and, uh, and friends from uh, uh, around the world, and uh, uh, just uh, maybe some of the countries are already ahead of uh, Russia. Uh, on the curve and uh, already relaxed the lockdowns. Uh, we are still uh, slowly uh, going forward from, from the lockdowns, uh, but uh, every month of lockdown actually brings uh, a blow to GDP growth uh, by 1.6%. So three months of lockdowns actually uh, will be uh, uh, effectively uh, show uh, almost down 4% by the end of the year. Uh, of course, there are all the other factors. Uh, again, going back to, to household income, why, why, why is it uh, um, dropping and slowing down? There are a lot of uh, layoffs or significant reduction of uh, base salary or uh, unpaid leaves uh, coming from uh, wholesale and retail uh, trade. Uh, that's uh, one of uh, Russian economic uh, sectors, which is actually uh, the largest employer, uh, one of the largest employers in, in, in Russia. And uh, in this sector, of course, during the lockdown and uh, slowdown of uh, economic activities, you, you can see a lot of people uh, actually being laying off or uh, put on uh, uh, unpaid vacation or paid vacation but, uh, with a certain reduction of uh, uh, base salary. So that's uh, where most of the uh, household income decrease is uh, generated. Um, um, what can we expect uh, from um, from uh, government and the uh, Central Bank of Russia support measures. So um, actually uh, Russian government is uh, quite sensitive uh, towards uh, increasing its debt. Uh, Russian uh, state debt is uh, actually one of the uh, lowest among the G20. It's uh, just above uh, 14%, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Russian government is uh, very, um, focused on uh, keeping it low. Uh, that's why the, the measures, the government and central bank measures, uh, they're not coming from, uh, from the debt, but uh, actually coming from redistribution of expenses. Um, the total amount of uh, measures introduced uh, by government and uh, central bank uh, account for 3.1 trillion rubles. It's uh, roughly 2.8% of GDP. Uh, uh, who will be the beneficiaries of um, of this um, of these measures of this support? Uh, of course, it will be uh, uh, it's 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 focused on on uh, uh, supporting the the households. So it will be a reduction of uh, uh, it will be a social support uh, payments to to employee. Uh, so it will be covering some of the some of the uh, decrease in salaries, uh, it will be um, unemployment benefits, uh, but of course uh, some, uh, uh, some of it uh, will also go to, to uh, state, uh, uh, state guarantees to, to regions uh, with the, for system, systemically important enterprises, uh, health, healthcare, 
etc. So overall, it's um, it's socially kind of oriented uh, uh, measures, and again, this uh, uh, this money will come uh, mostly from uh, from a budget uh, which uh, was uh, secured for uh, national national projects, and some of it will come from uh, national wealth fair fund. Uh, just a few words about National Welfare Fund and uh, where this money comes from. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about the, the so-called uh, budget rule. So um, uh, Russia is uh, having uh, almost 600 billion US dollars of uh, FX reserves, uh, which is uh, quite significant uh, amount if you think about it. Uh, Russian total debt, uh, including state debt, uh, financial institution debt, corporate debt, uh, everybody's debt. Uh, so it's all uh, can be covered by, uh, by Russian, uh, Russian FX reserves. So these uh, reserves were uh, accumulated uh, since uh, 2014 and uh, important, uh, important uh, measure was introduced in 2017. Uh, which uh, actually um, brought a lot of uh, stability in uh, in, uh, in the country uh, economic ways. So uh, this budget rule uh, works uh, quite simple. Uh, every year, the government will set the uh, threshold uh, for uh, oil prices. So if uh, the oil prices are higher than than the, this threshold, uh, the excess amount of uh, uh, hard currency liquidity, uh, US dollars, uh, euros, which will be coming as a revenue into the country, will be accumulated by a National Welfare Fund. If it's uh, the uh, oil prices are below this uh, threshold, then uh, this National Welfare Fund will be actually spent to support support the, the economy and, uh, and uh, stability of uh, ruble. So that's actually what is happening uh, now, uh, if um, if you look at the uh, ruble and the oil prices, well, oil prices were, you know, the, the volatility was was terrible. You know, we've never seen the things like this before, right? Negative oil prices even. Um, nonetheless, uh, ruble actually is uh, holding quite well. Uh, again, thanks to the efforts of our uh, central bank, which uh, you know brought uh, brought the stability. Uh, you can see on the right hand side uh, chart that uh, Russian ruble uh, has declined by 10%, but uh, uh, the correlation between the oil drop uh, price uh, is, uh, is not that, uh, that strong with the, with the ruble. The ruble actually uh, weakened and weakened a lot, but 10% uh, is 10%. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, even though uh, during the end of March and April, the, 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 the volatility in oil prices persist, the uh, ruble actually stabilized and now, and now it's uh, strengthening. Um, so all in all, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a difficult uh, uh, next uh, six months of uh, this year. Uh, I personally think, uh, you know, uh, these uh, results, the which we which we expect from Russian economy are not that bad. You know, if you compare it to the uh, other global uh, uh, important uh, economies, um, Russia again uh, is uh, quite stable in 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 its macro, uh, quite healthy debt levels. Uh, we are not increasing debt levels. Our um, budget is. Um, uh, Going to take a, to take a hit uh, this year, but it will be easily covered by by issuance of uh, uh, government bonds uh, within uh, within Russia on the Russian domestic uh, markets, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully we will see uh, if if not a V shape uh, recovery of the economic growth, but it will be a U shape recovery uh, <clears throat> by the end of uh, this year and uh, and the beginning of next. Again, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties uh, persist in the economy. Uh, we uh, we are um, we're going, of course, to, to 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 track and monitor all the macro levels and and uh, update our uh, forecasts. 
So uh, if you're interested, uh, I guess uh, you can also uh, always uh, ask for DP to 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 uh, to share some uh, some research materials which we we can provide. Thank you. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, thank you, Artyom, for the interesting presentation. Okay, quite uh, useful and quite technical. Uh, okay, after I'm sure I, I already see uh, many questions uh, coming in. So let's immediately move to our Q and A session. So I will, of course, we we are try to uh, answer all the questions uh, of our attendees. But we will start from uh, uh, the, the, the first one for Mr. Deniskin. Uh, Mr. Den Deniskin, could you explain in more detail services that the Chamber of Commerce can provide to foreign companies that would like to invest in Russia? Especially if you are here in Shanghai, we would like to know if Chinese investors are very, uh, uh, sometimes we receive their request, if you can do something for them uh, please explain to us. Uh, he's, you're, unmute. you're mute. Wait, one uh, Mr. Lenskin, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. Okay. Oh. Yes. Okay. Oh yes. Please. Okay. Thank you for question. Um, I would like to to. To add some some words about this uh, to, to, to answer this question I would like to answer this question and within the structure of our uh, CCI in Moscow we have the special department investment department uh, the main purpose of this department is prepare the special project uh, uh, all of uh, all of our regions have, uh, have a lot of projects and uh, under the governmental support uh, in these regions uh, our CCI, regional CCI, together with uh, the local government, prepared a special presentation. And uh, they send this presentation for uh, our department, the investment department. They uh, do some procedures with this presentation and they send it uh, to our office in Shanghai. And we can, uh, our purposes, provide this information to our partners in China itself or otherwise. So, uh, before the coronavirus, of course, we uh, had a special business mission. We prepared a special offline missions and we uh, present uh, these products for our customers, for our partners in China. And after that, our clients, our Russian companies uh, could start a conversation with Chinese uh, companies who, uh, who are interested in these uh, projects. Uh, so this time we, uh, we can uh, provide these services uh, for online base, of course, and uh, uh, for instance, not so long ago, I received a special project uh, from uh, St. Petersburg. This is a real estate project. Uh, our uh, Chamber of uh, St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce and Industry prepared it uh, under the government of support. And uh, if uh, if you are interested in, I can share uh, this information with you. After our office in St. Petersburg uh, sent us this, uh, this presentation. So this is the model of our working with the investment. Uh, uh, for the other side, we can uh, discuss questions with the uh, Chinese uh, companies who, who are interested to, to, uh, to receive investments in China. But this is uh, very uh, <laughs> very sensitive case because uh, I, I don't know I don't know uh, how how uh, what was the uh, the uh, uh, what what are they going to uh, receive from from these investments? So if they uh, if uh, Chinese companies uh, are ready to uh, develop our relations in this sphere, we, we are ready to, to do this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Niskin. Just one more question from my side. Maybe I can represent also some Chinese. Like uh, in uh, your Shanghai office, are you able to also to provide the services in Chinese or? Because sometimes uh, some Chinese uh, uh, investors, they may have some language problem when they invest in Russia. Um, we can do it, we can discuss, no, no problem. Okay, if you if you have a specific case, we can discuss every case and in every case we, we, we can find a solution. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Niskin. Much appreciated. Okay. Okay, next question is for Mr. Artyom. Okay. Uh, as we all know now, uh, this year, besides the, uh, the COVID-19 issue, we also have the oil shocks, as you mentioned in your slides. So, do you believe, like low oil prices, we are at pressure on factor revenues, and what average oil price do you expect in 2020? Thank you, Matteo. Um, let me bring back the presentation slides, uh, just uh, to illustrate uh, better the, the answer. So, um, Just give me a second. Yes. No. So yes, uh, actually, oil prices uh, will will bring a significant uh, difficulty to 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 the uh, to the budget. Uh, if you can see on the left hand uh, hand side uh, chart, uh, the uh, Russia has a pro progressive taxation on oil and uh, gas sector, so um, which means the higher the the price of uh, oil and gas, uh, the, the 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 higher the the percentage uh, uh, is uh, going for for the for the budget collection. Um, we we've seen the the prices uh, this year already below uh, fifteen dollars per barrel. And uh, this, uh, at, at this uh, moment, uh, actually, the, the budget collection are, uh, are fades away. Uh, it goes to uh, almost zero. So um, uh, the budget itself is actually uh, still quite um, uh, manageable. Uh, Russian, Russia actually shown uh, a few years in a row of uh, budget surplus, and uh, we expect uh, 2020 will be the first uh, year uh, since a while uh, to when we will have a deficit of the budget. Uh, but the budget uh, deficit uh, will be again uh, quite quite manageable. It's uh, in uh, our forecast we we put 3.8 uh, percent of GDP, and um, this uh, will be uh, quite well covered uh, by. Uh, by issuance of uh, domestic debt or, or uh, from the funds of uh, National Welfare Fund. Um, we also believe that, uh, you know, um, it could be better. Uh, it, it could be the, the deficit uh, number could be uh, much smaller uh, if, uh, if the oil price will recover. And uh, this is answering your second part of uh, your question. Uh, so for for the rest of um, this year, we actually our our expectations that the average uh, uh, oil price for for the whole year uh, brand prices uh, will be forty dollars uh, and forty cents. Uh, we've seen uh, in the first few months the the price uh, was actually well above uh, uh, sixty dollars per barrel for for brand. And uh, uh, after the uh, big drop in uh, volatility, we see that the prices are recovering today. The brand prices are actually already uh, about 39 uh, US dollars per barrel. So uh, we, we actually expect uh, that the, uh, the average will be uh, above 40. And that uh, gives us a certain uh, uh, Confidence to say that uh, it will we will see the U-shape uh, recovery uh, of uh, Russian economy. Um, a lot of people are uh, mistakenly thinking that uh, Russian econ economy is uh, over dependent on uh, on oil prices. Uh, it's uh, not entirely true. Uh, still, oil uh, revenues are uh, are significant for for Russian uh, budget collection, but uh, uh, it's. Uh, it fluctuates between uh, 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so this year, due to the uh, sharp uh, drop of the prices, we expect uh, it will uh, go to uh, 30 percent of, of the budget, uh, the tax collection from uh, oil and gas sector. 
hope it answers. Yes. Okay, thank you, Artyom. Very interesting uh, question and uh, very professional answers. Okay, now we have also one question for Miss uh, Alexandra. Like, uh, can foreign investors reimpatriate dividends from Russia to our HQ? Please. It's also a very common question I received here in, in Shanghai. So, please. Thank you, Leo. And it is really, uh, it is a problem, it was a problem, but I would like to point out that in uh, 2020, uh, especially January 2020, uh, a specific regulations were uh, put uh, in force. So, and the, the certain regulation, the current regulation that restrict you to uh, get back uh, the funds from Russia to your home country, to Asia border, uh, were removed uh, for those countries who members to the FUD, for example, uh, China, meaning that uh, there was a free uh, the flow of money between the banks uh, of uh, China, for example, and Russia uh, became uh, free uh, to because of the fact that the members of the FUD provided the information uh, for the bank uh, the, the holders of the bank accounts. So for the those, if your uh, headquarter located in the country who participate in a FAT means that uh, you would be uh, uh, removed from the restrictions on the uh, currency, uh, repatriation of the currency and the payment of dividends, and you would also be removed from the requirement to uh, provide a, a supplementary information to the bank to execute the payments. So it significantly uh, ease uh, your presence in Russia. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex. So our uh, last question, uh, let's say, because time is up, unfortunately. After I, I, I see also Ms. Daniskin has already uh, answered to several questions of our attendees, so thank you very much. And the last question is for uh, Artyom, because we got this uh, uh, interesting, because he also said, and his friend said, Really interesting speech, and many now many Chinese are investing in Moscow about in the real estate market. So, what do you think about it? Is it a wise choice now? Please, Artyom. Well, um, mm, Russian real estate market. Um, um, okay, and and this is my my personal view. There is no uh, any kind of investment recommendation I could give on on the real estate market because I'm. Uh, covering the uh, capital markets. Uh, I am uh, much more confident in my uh, views on uh, different securities. But uh, uh, in my view, Russian uh, real estate market is uh, very cheap right now at the moment, uh, given that uh, the cheapness of ruble is uh, uh, this year is also uh, added up on top of this. I don't see how it can get any lower. So I think it's actually it could be a a uh, good entry point. Uh, and um, uh, just to, to illustrate, um, uh, one of uh, my, my good friends here in Hong Kong, uh, he, 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 he's, uh, you know, he, he's Hong Kongese and, and he traveled to, uh, to Russia several times on, on my advice and, and he absolutely fell in love with, with Moscow. Uh, and he's uh, quite happy with his real estate investments and uh, he just bought another two units in, uh, in Moscow City. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. Thank you, Artyom, for your, let's say, personal advice. But uh, anyway, we, I believe our attendees and our friends would consider it. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for, or thank you to Mr. Artyom, Mr. Teniskin to speak. And thank you to Alex to share about uh, your knowledge with our attendees today. And uh, Today, we, uh, that's all for our today's uh, uh, webinar and uh, hope to see you soon next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.